got BK and Dave Williams, true to form, on before we were. Oh, how are you, Jay? How is it? In case Harry doesn't come on, how did you survive the last couple of days while I was at SAMCOM? It was tough. <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty tough. Just, you know, it seems like right now, everybody's coming to you with stories that you're not able to write about. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. It's Everything's embargoed right now. <laughs> so it's a lot of work that doesn't show up on the pages immediately. Yeah. Right. Ag agree. Agree. But yeah, agree. They're like, hey, next year. <laughs> but that's, and that's the frustrating thing about Samcom too. Like, it's a lot of fun, but you spend a lot of time inevitably writing something that they're like, oh no, we're not going to let you write that yet. And I'm like, and some of the stuff you've seen in their other shows or we've written about because we've found it other places, but that's just, you know, the nature of the beast. At least it is nice to get the face time and, you know. See For sure. Everything. Yeah. But yeah, it's the Super Bowl stuff right yeah. now. Yeah. That's like, yeah. um, everybody wants to talk about, but no one wants you to write about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Agree. The other thing that's funny about the Super Bowl is that if I'm understanding it correctly, like AB will release all of its spots before Super Bowl, you know? Um, yeah. But Molson Coors is, is not going to release theirs until day of, which, which is interesting, right? Like, I guess you get more anticipation, but less total game mileage that way. But they're doing the other stuff, like their little New York Times, you know, spat. Yeah. Big light I, brand. I feel like, um, well, I don't know. I mean, we've only been used to AB's ads and they've made it, you know, available on YouTube or wherever. Yeah. In the I days leading up. So, yeah. but I feel like a lot of brands do that. I feel like. Nobody's yeah. seen anything new the day of the Super Bowl anymore. Yeah, well, except for the FTX bouncing <laughs> one minute or was it 30 seconds or one minute? Where's the his buddy, SBF. Buddy, FBF, or yeah, SFB, SBF, whatever. He gets on all those. <laughs> What's next, Jordan? It was chat GPT. He was obsessed with that. And now we'll see what the next thing is that he's obsessed with. But he's going to start a tech business daily. Yeah, I'm sure he'll he'll inform us in our editor's thread. Yeah, Probably Friday out. afternoon. Oh, hey guys, <laughs> 5 p.m. All right, well, let's, speaking of that, slagger, slagger, straggler, Harry. <laughs> my brain is mush from these last few days traveling. I'm going to go ahead and admit to BK and Dave. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome to BeerNet Radio. How are you? Doing great, Chen. How's it going? Good. I was just telling Jordan that my brain isn't working because I, I was traveling for Samcom in Anaheim and I just got back late, late last night. So if I if the words sound like they might be words that, you know, or are close enough, <laughs> just go ahead and give me the ball there. <laughs> That's the way we feel all the time. <laughs> you got so. this, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Hey, Dave. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? No complaints, at least not yet today. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. farther into the day for it than we are. So that, that looks good for us, I guess. Nice. The halfway point. Yeah. So far, so good. Nice. Nice. Well, yeah, we just wanted to have you guys on because we wanted to ask you all of the questions. You guys always have awesome updates. You sent one out a couple weeks ago, State of the Union. We just thought we'd, you know, give you a quick fire round about all the hot topics. Who better to answer them than y'all? Well, right? yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I like that list of questions you sent through. I think yeah. that covered most of the areas. If we had to guess about what, you know, what anyone wanted to hear about, these have nailed it with this. Yeah. Lesson. Yeah. yeah. That's what everybody's calling <laughs> asking those same <laughs> buckets of five questions in 50 different ways on every single one, but everybody's after the same thing. Got it. Well then let's give our listeners a preview. So of course I had to ask about RTDs and shelf space. I had to ask about pricing, light beer, um, you know, non-alc. And things like bleeding into things like hop waters. Jordan has some really good pointed ones, but let's start, um, you know, let's start with pricing, right? I think we just heard that the economy grew like 2% last year. You know, we've gone back and forth whether a recession's a foregone conclusion, but I know that we're lapping January price increases. So theoretically that provides a little bit of stability. Um, what's the data telling you guys about, you know, maybe if consumers are tolerating these price increases in beer, and is there anything that the data tells you about whether people are going to take more pricing? I mean, if they can, I'm sure they will, right? So we did a actually did a survey recently. It was across a lot of beverage alcohol, you know, beer, CDs, 
wine and spirits. So we tried to hit those four major buckets. And you know, one of the questions we asked them was about thinking back in 2022, how did your purchase frequency change versus 2021? And beer shoppers, you know, they were pretty resilient. A lot of them said, I think close to 40% said that they um, in- increased their yeah. purchase frequency in 2022. And then a close to another 40% said they maintained. So that was promising. That tells me, tells us that the beer drinkers are resilient in their frequency. But what was concerning was that RTD shoppers, wine shoppers, spirit shoppers, a lot more of them said that they increased their Mm. frequency. So beer, you know, relatively stable, but, you know, losing ground, I think you could say. Um, You know, as it relates to pricing, we obviously saw that big spike in Q4 in terms of how everything jumped up to the consumer. And I think there was a little bit of shakiness in that response rate. We saw dollars about maintain their pace, but volume kind of slowed a bit as consumers made some new decisions. At the, um, I think looking forward, um, we're still seeing growth among certain high-end segments. So it, there hasn't been a complete abandoned ship. When beer drinkers go to the shelf and look at the brands they used to buy or the packages they used to buy, but I think there are some shoppers out there that are now making different decisions based on disposable income, smaller pack size, maybe trading down in some cases as well. We saw the rise of singles play a very key role in hitting a nice price point for consumers. So I think pricing, among other things, certainly played a role in shopper behaviors. And you know, I know we're only two weeks in data-wise into 2023, but we're seeing a lot of those similar behaviors from Q4 kind of play out over these early weeks. Yeah, we talk about pricing as being a 2022. We had it all year. It really ticked up, like Dave was saying, in Q4. So it was kind of a slow adoption to actually see through what we're seeing in Nielsen until you got to Q4. And then it was a pretty significant step up. I mean, from about the 4 to 5%, we saw anywhere from 7 to 10% as far as pricing increases in there as well. So the consumer is still settling in. And we talk about these as kind of turbulent and tumultuous times. The consumer is starting to feel it. They're starting to get adjusted to it. But it's not like they've been living with it for a full year just yet. So we are seeing all those impacts. Retailers, flat year in overall dollars. When you look at the supplier side, number of cases going out the door and the efficiencies that that brings coming down a little bit, that's where the the wrangling is starting to go to come about in this industry and people trying to find a way to get more boxes out there in the current pricing environment. Yeah. Let yeah. me ask you about the retailers because we had, you know, heard and read in some cases, the retailers are going up a lot more, you know, than the supplier suggested pricing type thing. Do you think we can expect to see that more of that or? You know, I think, you know, once you make a declaration, whatever happens down the chain is somewhat out of your hands, right? You can make a suggestion, you can get, you know, satisfied on one end, but how that trickles through is kind of out of your control. And I think retailers, you know, they want to make the price of goods as affordable for their customers as possible, because, you know, what at the end of the day, they care most about what foot traffic, right? Foot traffic and basketing. So they don't want to scare their shoppers away, especially if not everyone around them is taking the same approach to pricing. Um, and, you know, there's word that things are going to stabilize again back to a normal cycle in 2023. That's been some of the early guidance or indications. But, you know, I still wonder too, it's not just beer, it's all the goods that consumers buy, right? You know, utilities, right. food, you know, groceries. So how much can we continue to push that? How close are we approaching to, to those elasticity thresholds among shoppers? You know, levels differ for everybody, but, you know, when you have that entire bucket of goods, utilities, other expenses that you're weighing against one another, I mean, at some point there's a give and a take. And I wonder, you know, where does beer settle into that give and take as a category and certainly by brand, by segment, by pack? Right. Well, one more follow up for me and then I'll let Jordan, I know he has some questions or related questions. See, there's like the word jumble. <laughs> um you know, Dave, you mentioned some of the work you guys have done and the RTD drinkers are seeming to outpace with their buying trends, right? What's driving that increased RTD and maybe some of the other segments? Behave? So I think we're seeing RTDs and even some of the more traditional spirits are doing a really good job of resonating with the younger demographic, the new legal drinking age consumers. Um, so that first experience is now starting with an RTD, whether that's spirits based, malt based, a seltzer, we kind of bucketed all those into that same world. So I think it's just who they're appealing to. 
um, out of the gate. I think we're seeing response among that younger demographic. You know, those are the drinkers that are going out more to the on-premise than the older demos. Those, um, you know, they're more familiar with online delivery. So a lot of the new ways to consume or obtain beverages among drinkers, it's skewing towards those RTD type segments. So I think that's certainly playing a role, but also, you know, retail focus and execution, right? Those are the brands and packages you're seeing on the game space, you're seeing on the floor with displays, you're seeing, you know, with marketing online or on TV or however it's consumed. So I think it's share of mind from all the tiers working down, but also it's what's being pushed to the forefront to consumers too, which I think is playing a major role in that. Yeah, I think that's a good point as far as the younger demographic, but we can't ignore the female demographic as well and the appeal of these other RTD styles, even to the point of FMBs and flavors and more towards that wine and spirits profile and the cocktail prevalence that's going across all beverages speaks more easily to both young and female as far as, hey, I'm more welcoming, come on in, this is what you're looking for versus the traditional beer model that's out there. So you are seeing success with companies that are appealing to both of those demographics and really catering to where their flavor profile is and then also hitting that sweet spot as far as ABV as well as price. Okay, um, let's talk about seltzer for a little bit. We've seen White Claw kind of get back to stable ground. It's early in the year, but it looks like it's growing again. Um, what's driving that? Any particular things you've seen? Any standout brands, White Claw brands? I think, I think one of the big things that White Claw has done is they've continued to innovate alongside their core lineup, right? You know, their, their refresher and then their higher ABV surge line. They've continued to put focus on those new or newer packages in addition to their core flavors and their original variety pack lineup. But you know, the other thing that I think really stands out for what White Claw has done is get the product out and executed at retail. If you look at the distribution levels for some of their, they're a lot higher than even the number two, three, four brands in the space. Um, there's a lot more cases on the floor for those brands. So I think it's continuing to focus on their core lineup while adding some innovation around it. But at the end of the day, it's getting the brands out to retail and to the consumers and ideally in the consumer's hands out the front door. So I think those are the two things that White Claw has done that other brands have done as well, just on a smaller scale. But that's helped White Claw stabilize and start to claw its what, no pun intended, claw its way <laughs> back to the growth. Man, that was a walked right into that one. <laughs> yeah, when you look at cross hard seltzer, those that are being successful are those that are that have a program and a plan in place ahead of time. They're very in tune with a lot what the life cycles are of their brands, with their flavors, of their pack sizes, and they have the next one ready to go. And it's not just, hey, we're gonna pull the lever when we're asked. They're telling the retailers, hey, here's what I'm seeing. I think that we can increase the base that we've built with this product into a next level by actually swapping it out ahead of the negative declines. So those that you're seeing that are being successful, take a look at the programming and the curating that they're doing. It's very meticulous. It's very thought thoughtful. And they're seeing the benefits at the retailer. And we talk a lot about shelf space. But we also talk a lot about the display and feature space. Those are also the brands that are getting the most features and share of the floor because they are new and exciting, even within a category that isn't performing as well as it has in the past, they're still bringing that excitement and keeping things fresh within there. And truly hasn't got back yet. It's still kind of still declining, but you know, their big play, truly hard seltzer vodka that has been in market for a few months now. Have y'all seen any read there? And what do you think about the spirit based variants? Is that going to help the overall brand or? Is that gonna... I think it'll help in terms of getting the brand name out to maybe a broader consumer base. You know, if they're looking more specifically on the spirit side than the malt or sugar base side. Um, you know, I think the other thing too with, with Truly is, like I said, there is still a, a distribution gap between what they've got on the shelf versus what White Claw's got on the shelf, and maybe that's um, you know a, a focus thing. Um, it could be a number of reasons, but I think. It, you know, the tools are there, the innovation is there to support, you know, truly or any of the other brands competing in the seltzer space. I think it's more just, you know, Mark Anthony right now is, it really has their eyes on the ball when it comes to riding the ship with White Claw and forging ahead. It's, 
you know, it's trying to re-secure, not that it ever lost it, but stabilize that, hey, we're the leader in the space and no one's going to elbow us off the shelf. Um, and then on the spirit side of things, yeah, that truly vodka soda, it's a great product. I think it, you're seeing a lot more vodka soda brands try to come at the high noon on that side of the world. And I think it's worth a shot, right? Those products are working right now. So, you know, it's, you know, try to fire an arrow across the bow of that ship, but um, you know, it's still not quite there in terms of scale yet. Um, nobody really is, but you know, that's certainly a much different space than what Seltzer has shaken out as, at least as it stands today. It seems like a lot of dead bodies that are along the path of the high noon trail to make Speaking a- Speaking of dead bodies, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. Sorry, I'm, a little, sorry I'm late. Um, You're but, right on time. No, I was listening and great stuff as usual. And um, I may have I missed it, but have you guys talked about spring resets? No. Okay. Yep. So, um, you know, we're getting in, we're almost in February. Everybody's gearing up. Are there any like themes or from retailers of what they're looking for or more particularly what they're not looking for spring resets? I think the number one, and stop me if you've heard this before, but going to continue to be flavor and that ready to drink landscape, right? Um, there are still winning seltzer brands like we were just talking about. That FMB space remains on fire. And it's not just the new stuff. It's some of the mainstays too that are still very much relevant, whether that's just because of their consumer base being super loyal or innovating alongside with a package format or flavor in that space as well. So I think you're going to see a retail focus on that end of it. And then at the end of the day, it's the same, same tenant, right? If you're not carrying your, if you're a duplicate, you know, skew in a brand, I'm going to pick one of the two. It's maybe those stale flagships or legacy brands that, that just don't have it anymore. I think we're seeing a lot more quick to act retailers and say, Hey, you know, you, you just don't got it. Um, in, in trimming space that way. So a little bit here, a little bit there, but you're seeing that shift in terms of really cater more toward what the consumers want, what they say they want, or, or what the consumer looks like and what they're buying. It's mm -hmm. going to continue to shift that way um, while the trends and the numbers support it. What we've right. seen in the conversations we've had, retailers aren't making big bets in 2023. They're being a little bit more cautious going with what they're looking for in addition to what Dave said as far as flavor and RTD and cocktail is tell me a good story. What is the reason for your brand? Success is a little bit different metric than it has been in the past. Are you better than the category? Are you better than your segment? Those are the ones that are going to maintain their shelf space. And I would argue that this year maintaining your shelf space is almost as valuable as gaining new points of distribution for new innovation. And glimpses that we've seen into the future are those that had decent stories in 2022 are going to maintain their shelf space. They're going to get the same amount of programming. And then the retailer is going to program around that with the innovation and the flavors. So overall, not cautious, but definitely safe, kind of a little bit more straight down the middle. And we've talked about this quite a bit aligned with the consumer, the brands they trust, the directions that they're going as far as flavor and innovation. Yeah, I think life cycles are pretty short with new brands lately, particularly, you know, seltzer and craft. So I think I don't want to say failed innovation, but innovation that's already almost one foot out the door that leaves open real estate, too. So we'll swap in whatever's next in the pipeline just to keep an interesting product on the shelf and um, keep the consumers happy. Right. And as as part of that, you know, craft had a tough year um, off premise. Do you think or are they vulnerable? right now some of these craft brands for losing space or if you have voodoo in your name i guess you're all right right or if you have a skeleton at least or something i think bk hit it on the head it's i mean just being stable in your real estate it is almost a win for craft now we saw a lot and this goes back to what i was talking about related to flagship brands we saw a, a flagship brands lose national distribution whether they were stretched too far or whether they just weren't turning as fast. I think craft is vulnerable, but it's not all craft, right? There's a ton of success stories there. I mean, you mentioned one right off the bat, you know, New Belgium has been crushing it with, with Voodoo. And I think it's because, again, to BK's point, the numbers support the support from retail, right? It's all right there. And I think, you know, package innovation, um, you know, package size and configuration and just, you know, supplementing the workhorse with something interesting on the side, but not trying to pull focus away from it, but complementary 
Innovation, I think, has helped brands right the ship or succeed in an in admittedly tough landscape for craft. It seems like there was it was really smart of New Belgium to do their refresh with Fat Tire now, you know, in, in January to maybe that is enough to hold space that they have and maybe even gain some space because um, it's new news, right? And retailers love new news. Um, and, you know, it, are we ever going to get away from just the IPA centric? Are there any all, any green shoots in any other style <laughs> or are we just IPA nation forever now? No, I mean, IPA is, you know, depending on where you look in the country, 40 to 50% of all craft dollars, right? 50 cents of every dollar spent is going toward an IPA. So you can't ignore that. I mean, that's going to be the bulk of it. But if you look at some of the growing styles, and I don't know if this has to do with pricing because the lighter styles, the Pilsners, the Lagers, the Ales tend to be at a slightly lower price point, mainly because it's 12 pack focused. Um, you know, or six packs instead of the 416. So I think we've seen a rise in those lighter styles and craft. You know, we've talked about this in years past. You can dial probably your podcast or your letters back, whether it's a blonde, whether it's a lager, whether it's a pilsner, we are seeing growth in those pockets. So there are certain ways for a brewer or a portfolio to win outside of IPA, but I mean, you can't ignore the numbers, you know, no, and- the traditional IPA. Right. Hazy still killing it. Session maybe slowing down a bit. So maybe you're keeping the focus on certain subsets of it, but it just, you know, it continues to prove itself over. The golden ale or the light lager dream has not come to fruition. And I know everybody's been wanting that because you can cycle through those a lot faster in a session and potentially sell more beer. But you're right. It seems like it's growing, but it just hasn't hit that IPA fun craze that that we've been always seeing. And then one, one last thing I wanted to pivot a little bit to, you know, I mentioned that there's a long line of corpses on the road of high noon, but also on the road to Michelob Ultra. And we're seeing some new entrants come after that premium, but low calorie, kind of, you know, low carb, low calorie with, is that a, you know, that seems like that could be a sweet spot, right? Mexican beers on fire, Modelo's on fire, Mick Ultra's on fire. It combines all two, but do, well, I don't know what my question is. I'm Jen. What's my question? You're they make a dent in Mick Ultra, right? Because they're yeah. a lot who tried, and, and Corona Premier is you know a decent sized business, but it's nowhere near the size of Mick Ultra. So, what are the prospects of these new brands like Oro? I think when you're looking at that proposition, you are starting to talk about breaking into some brand loyalty. And we say the brand loyalty is dead and gone, or kind of at least on the decline. There is still some brand loyalty, especially within the imports and within that Michelob Ultra consumer. So you do have to crack that code and at least get the trial, get the trial that people have been successful with that in the past to Harry's point, but now you have to get the repeat. That's what all of these people that have been following have been missing out on. So there is a crack. I mean, that style has continued to grow or that consumer base has grown. Maybe they're starting to look outside. We haven't seen it just yet, but now is definitely the time to try because you are taking advantage of those two things that are growing as far as imports and then light beer. And then also introducing a little bit of flavor into some of these new entrants is is a new twist that we haven't seen yet. Yeah. Cool. Well, let me ask, because, you know, we mentioned light beer and I don't want to leave this call without asking this question. So I just came back from Samcom and one of the big things was the long awaited Bud Light campaign. Right. Um, And we'll share more over the next few days, but it's one of the most diverse campaigns they've done on Bud Light in a long time. But my question is, you know, their whole thing is like one foot in the past, one foot in the future. And we expect to see Bud Light snag young drinkers, a new generation? Like what is the data? What does your work tell about the prospects? Cause I feel like that's a high bar, right? Like most Bud Light drinkers are 40 and over. So easy there no, on the is- ages uh, thing, Jen. <laughs> hey, she 40. was kind with 40. <laughs> Treading on thin ice. Okay. Kind with 40. <laughs> hey, I'm 40 bro. So that's true. That's true. Um, it's I'm glad this topic came up because of all the other areas we talked about, like light beer has been one that has been on the back burner, right? Everyone just kind of has accepted, oh, you know, another mediocre year, maybe dollars are up, but volume's gonna continue to slide. So I hope, um, I hope that Bud Light is successful with that, right? Because the category is only as healthy as its leaders. Nobody really has the size to offset any ongoing declines from the leaders in the space. So it's crucial 
for brands like Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, the heavier versions, you know, the high octane versions to, to carry the weight or to lead by example. Um, I think again, going back to that survey, it's beer has struggled to resonate with those younger drinkers. So it's got to steal back that first occasion from these new shoppers. It's got to make itself resonate because a lot of the open feedback just talks about, you know, the younger generation, this is just what we're drinking, whether it's the RTDs, you know, the seltzers, the cocktails, things like that. So it really just has to find a way to, to resonate again. And I think it can, um, I think, I don't think light log are out of the, you know, out of the possibility for a younger de demographic. There's been a rise in Bush Light Miller High Life for a long time right now. Now, granted, it's a, you know, that below or sub premium level, but there's proof that there's a healthy consumer base there, right? You're just hoping to trade them up to the world of Bud Light. Um, so I'm not saying it's not doable, but it's going to have to be a different approach than what's been tried over the last X number of years to right that ship again. Excitement and something that resonates with that consumer is something that has been lacking across, if you want to call it the, the entire light beer category. So anything that brings more excitement and more effort and push to connect with consumers back into that traditional avenue for beer is a good thing. I'm just glad they're spending again, like you said. I mean, it helps the beer category when AB opening their pocketbook, which it seems like they are, again, on their core brands and not these kind of weird offshoots. And, the, and lastly, I would say, I heard this from a reader, an unbelievable thing that he was shopping at HEB and they were giving out tastings of Bud Light, like a, you know, like a woman behind a table giving little cups of Bud Light. And I was like, wow, what a low impact, expensive for a, for a brand that has 98%, you know, brand, what am I trying to say again, Jen? Brand awareness. Awareness. Thank God. Brand awareness handing out samples. But, you know, I started thinking about it and I was like, I bet for a lot of people, it's like, you know, I forgot about Bud Light and it's kind of refreshing. Maybe try it again for the first time. Right. Yes. Uh, right. I, Harry, I agree with you. There's so many good quality brands out there that consumers know, but when's the last time they had one. Right. Oh. And then if you can open their eyes, you know, even at that, that low level, you know, start moving it that way, start a little bit of a groundswell. Now you're right. I don't know if that one sampling event is going to, <laughs> you know, right the ship, but you need to do something to get people back on the team or open people's eyes to, this is why we're the king of beers, you know, out of the gate, right? It, you got to do something to drive that excitement to BK's point, just get people talking about it for whatever reason. Hopefully and if, if nothing else, it, you know, it gives old ladies employment options. And <laughs> I mean, oh, Harry. but you know, if you multiply <laughs> that times, you know, 300 stores and you do it on a Friday, maybe it does move the, or, you know, it probably was a sell in, you know, do the ad and we'll put a taster in, you know, 20 stores. I don't know. Who knows? I, but it's I also a to. point of difference because that consumer, like the eroding light beer consumer, when was the last time they had a Bud Light, Miller no Light, or a Coors right. Light? You put it in front of them, you've basically taken the space of a large 50 to 100 case display in that consumer's mind and you're going to stand out because now it's an experience like they're able to connect a little bit more personally with it if you haven't been a consumer of light beer lately when was the last time you had any of those and it has all the product attributes that seltzer has been crowing about you know it's low <laughs> calorie it's refreshing you can drink 12 of them i mean i can i don't know about you guys but i'm kind of oh, a yeah, standard deviation around that right <laughs> give or take yes. 11. i'm what malcolm gladwell calls an outlier <laughs> Reach for uh, the stars, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Let me do one more since there's a couple more days in January. Um, and I don't think we covered this yet, the non-alc thing, right? So Harry loves to rub in my face that the dry January the patient is down. Um, <laughs> what does do you think that signals storm clouds for you know increased share growth of non-alc beer? Or is could that partially be just a normalization of people are drinking that? you know, throughout different occasions year round. I think it's, I think it's more the latter. Um, I think non-alc, the reason it's been on fire lately is because it's trying to break out of that. We're only here for this particular occasion or couple of occasions, right? It's done a great job of ingratiating itself among just any possible occasion among beer drinkers, right? So I, I think it's becoming more normalized and, you know, the patient might be down, but trends for non-alc, it's two weeks of data. And obviously the comps for non now keep going up, you know, lower in the past, higher in the future. But, um, you know, it's growing at just as fast a clip 
out of the gate in 23 as it did a year ago or a Q4 of 22. So I think dollars and volume continue to pull through and share continues to, to chip away at the bigger thing. I think dollars were above a one share for beer over these first two weeks when it's, you know, it just, it's on its way up. So I think it's done a great job of becoming more of a normalized option and less of a event-based thing. Although obviously holidays, you know, for non-alc, like a dry January, you're going to see hopefully a spike like you do 4th of July for domestics or any other type of. Uh, yeah. I don't think we're going to measure the success of an on-alc by dry January. It's more of that habitual. It's a part of my routine. It's a part of my health, my wellness that carries on for the other 11 months in the year into, if you want to call it moderation or health and wellness, but it is a drinking occasion that didn't exist that continues to grow now. Dry January happens to be, yeah, it's a, it's the holiday of non-alc right now. <laughs> But it also sets the tone for the rest of the year and how you want to live and what part non-alc is going to play in your drinking routine. It's got to be I, a great trial driver for somebody like Athletic and the others that, you know, even if you don't do dry January, you're more likely to try it during because your friends are doing it or whatever. And Absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. what, how long do you think we get to two share with this segment? I mean, is that like a two year proposition or are we looking like 10 years? It took a while to go from half to one. Um, over the last two, three years. So I don't know if it's going to double like that, you know, in a short term, but, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% every month, every quarter of growth. You know, not saying it's not possible um, in the short term, but, you know, the signs are there right now. The momentum is behind it for sure. And obviously there's a lot more eyes on that space and input from the big guys down to the local craft guys. So, you know, why not? Yeah, new entrants are going to be a key to that and whether they, quote, overdo it or not. But the technology is more prevalent now. The ability to contract brew or outsource your non-alc, there's more resources for that as well. And then you look at the other environment where retailers, instead of just sticking it on a warm shelf, it's becoming a part of their beer set in the cold set, in the cold shelf. Those are all ways that non-out can continue to grow. I think it's a very valid point, though, as far as what is that ceiling? What is the tipping point? Does it stall there and then grow again? Or do we see a little bit of a backslide? And that's what we're curious to see, especially the first three months of the year. And when the spring resets start to really take hold, I think we'll get a better feel for how much of non-out we're going to be seeing in the future and what share we can measure its success by. If you look within craft, I bet it approaches a two share soon of craft beer. Total beer, I mean, you don't get non-alc in all the segments that are really resonating. So it does dilute, I guess, how you'd look at it. Maybe if at a more segment level, two share is much more achievable than maybe total beer. Cool. Man, you guys are smart, you know? <laughs> I mean, and I saw you on the Today Show. That was that was impressive. You made us. You made the industry look smart. I hope you noticed. I did not wear a flannel today. I wore a nice three quarter zip because yeah. I got dogged on for wearing the flannel. I didn't realize it was going the actual today show. I thought it was maybe <laughs> an online offshoot. So, uh, so awesome. I tried to dress up now and prepare for any occasion. Man, it's beer uh, and Bev Alec. It should be casual. Yeah, yeah, man. You look like a craft, cool craft. Great. Yeah. Don't, you don't want to act like those wine and spirits assholes and be in a suit. Yeah. You know, I'll cut that in post. No. All right, Jen, you can take us home. <laughs> all right. Well, no, that's about it, guys. So I appreciate it. And I hope to see y'all out there soon. Um, yeah. When are we getting together? CBC or? Hopefully that? before that, but that's usually a pretty good target on the map, right? You know, it's probably going to be there. So let's aim for that. But if it happens before, even better. Yeah. We well, welcome any opportunities. Let us know where you are and we're, we'll probably be out on the road also. Yeah. All right. Better you than me. I am done with flying. So you heard it, Harry. You're going to the next thing. Oh, oh man. You're telling me that as I'm hopping on my way to the airport here in about 40 oh, minutes. Shit. You're a professional though, BK. You know, you were built for this. Oh, know? yeah. You, you. I'm a seasoned vet. I don't know if anybody's a professional at it anymore with the current state. Yeah. It's, I don't it's an accumulation know. game in terms of status, right? Not a performance. Well, listen, thank you guys for being on. You know this. This is the podcast where all your dreams come true. And I hope, I hope that your dreams are coming true and they continue to come true now that once we publish this tomorrow. And that's your ASMR. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that you have a soothing plane ride, BK. 
Deacon. You do look like quite the DJ there, Harry. I'll give you that. Uh, got my Stevie Nicks going. Very professional. The whole vibe I'm digging right now. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty polished. I'm desperately trying to be young. The kids call this thirsty. Harry, you should wear a booger shirt next time. I'm a booger. I've been longboarding. You know, it's ridiculous. Oh, I see some of it online. I'm keeping tabs on your, oh, good. your Benjamin Button approach to life right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to die of birth pretty soon here when I fall oh. off that damn board. <laughs> oh, we all die of birth, Harry. It's the number one predictor of death, in fact. <laughs> That's a good bullshit, Jen. Look at Jen pulling out good bullshit. Wow. Right all right. Well, listen, have a good day, and we'll see you on the backside, boys. Yep. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Bye.